So in continuing this short video lecture series about water resources and water availability, you just heard about the Aral Sea disaster and how the Aral Sea was impacted as a result of over withdrawal from that area. Now I'd like to share with you about Lake Chad where the size of this lake has been reduced by 90% over the past 40 years. The lake itself extended over four countries originally in Chad, Niger, Nigeria, and Cameroon. The lake is located in northern Africa and was considered the sixth largest lake in the world back in 1963. As you can see by the timeline, in 1973, 10 years, a significant reduction in the size of the lake occurred. In 1987, even more of a reduction to the point that it has split into three different lobes. In 1997, again, three separate water bodies. And in 2007, only these two small areas contain water. The green areas depict vegetation and the light tan area depicts the former shoreline. This incident with Lake Chad has been declared an ecological catastrophe by the international community. The impact of the drying lake is causing tension among communities around Lake Chad. There are repeated conflicts among different people from different countries over the control of the remaining water. Cameroonians and Nigerians in Derrick Village, for example, constantly fight over the water. Nigerians claim to be the first settlers in the village, while Cameroonians invoke nationalistic sentiments since the village is within the Cameroonian territory. Fishermen also want farmers and herdsmen to cease diverting lake water to their farmlands and livestock. So this is definitely a water-stressed, water-conflict area. The consequences of this ecological catastrophe is that there's a lack of fresh water in the area. There's been a loss of crops, a collapse of the fisheries, and obviously water conflict between people between different countries. Possible solutions would be to develop sustainable use of the remaining lakes ecosystem, develop better sustainable agricultural practices, and try to set up a Lake Chad replenishment project. Plans to replenish the lake have been considered. One option was to build a dam and 60 miles of canals to pump water uphill from the Congo River to the Chari River and then back into Lake Chad. The replenishment project would be the first of its kind in Africa. The Commission has raised more than $5 million for a feasibility study to consider if this is even an option. Although the total cost of the project wouldn't be known until the study is completed, Experts expect it will take a huge injection of funds to save this lake. Already, the World Bank is providing about $10 million for a project to reverse land and water degradation near the area of this lake. Again, here's a picture from 1972 of how the lake encompassed parts of Niger, Nigeria, Cameroon, and Chad. And then in 2007, there's no water in Niger at all, barely any water, maybe like a wetland area. Nigeria has a little bit of water and then you have Cameroon and Chad really have the largest remains of the water from the lake itself. Now I've given you two examples of impacts on the environment from overdrawing water from lakes or surface water, the Aral Sea and Lake Chad. Now let's talk about water stress in the United States. This map in the top right depicts the average annual precipitation in centimeters in the United States. And this map on the bottom depicts areas which are experiencing various water shortages. By the way, the blue colors depict metropolitan regions with populations greater than 1 million. The orange depicts adequate supply areas. The yellow depicts shortage and the dark yellow depicts acute shortage. You can see there's a correlation with the areas that get a good bit of rainfall to those areas that are considered to be an adequate supply. But still, 
there's some zones even here within Pennsylvania which are considered to be in a shortage and that pertains to the amount of withdrawals that are occurring in relation to the amount of supply that's available. This map on the left side of your screen depicts water stress in the United States. In many parts of our country there's competing demands for water that create stress in local and regional watersheds. The map shows the water supply stress index for the U.S. We can see that the U.S. is pretty much divided in two where the, the west faces a higher level of water stress compared to the east side of the U.S. which has a very low index for water stress. High risk regions include the southwest with California being the number one state facing scarcity and you can tell based on the uh, color coding here that California has the greatest area that's considered to be in a high water supply stress index. Then the western Great Plains as well as the northwest. Watersheds are considered stressed when the water demand from power plants, agriculture, and municipalities exceeds 40% of the water supply that's available. This figure depicts the water hotspots in 17 western states that by 2025 could face intense conflicts over scarce water needed for urban growth, irrigation, recreation, and wildlife. Some analysts suggest that this is a map depicting those locations where you shouldn't go live in the foreseeable future. And please notice that the blue depicts unmet rural water needs, green indicates moderate conflict potential, orange indicates substantial conflict potential, and red indicates high conflict potential. So let's talk about the Colorado River Basin and what has happened there. On the left hand side of your screen is a map of the Colorado River Basin or the watershed. This is the area that's drained by this river system and it's more than one twelfth of the land area of the lower 48 states. The map also depicts six of the river's 14 dams that have been built upon the river. So in 1922 and 1944 there were legal contracts that were signed regarding the allocation of water from the Colorado River watershed. Basically the contracts allotted for the allocation of more water for human use in the US and Mexico than the river could actually supply even during those rare years when there isn't a drought. Since 1960 the river has rarely flowed fully to the Gulf of California where it used to flow to and enter the ocean because of reduced water flow. Primarily the cause of this is many dams that have been constructed along the river itself as well as increased water withdrawals and prolonged drought in the southwestern part of the United States. The river also receives large amounts of pollutants from urban areas with stormwater runoff, farms, animal feedlots, and industry as it makes its way to the sea. Increasing population and economic development continue to place increasing demand on this very limited supply of surface water in our western United States. The pictures on the right is a satellite comparison of water levels in Arizona and Utah's Lake Powell between 1999 and 2013. Here's 1999 and here's 2013. It shows a huge reduction in the amount of water in the lake and this is from NASA. Also, for the first time in U.S. history, in 2014, our government ordered that the flow of the Colorado River water from the 50-year-old Glen Canyon Dam be slashed due to a water crisis brought about by the region's historic 14-year dra drought. So, basically, this flow reduction will leave the Colorado River about 9% below its normal um, flow level that's supposed to be supplied downstream to Lake Mead for use in California, Nevada, Arizona, and Mexico. The Colorado River Basin is definitely one in which water allocation and water rights are stressed. So we have seven states that rely on the Colorado River and this pie chart depicts the water use across those seven states. 79% of the water pulled from the river is used for irrigation in agricultural industries. About 17% is used for public drinking water. 
3% is used for livestock and aquaculture, and 2% is for mining and industry. If we added the livestock aquaculture to the irrigation, it would be 82% of the water pulled from the Colorado River is geared towards use within the agricultural industry. So the graph on the left is a 10-year running average for the Colorado River Basin supply in use. The red line depicts the 10-year running average of basin water use and the blue line depicts the 10-year running average basin water supply. So we're getting to a point that the water use is exceeding the available water supply. Also, I mentioned earlier that there's several states involved in which there's specific uh, allocation allotted to how much those states can draw from the Colorado River. And California gets the highest allotment at 27%, with Colorado following at 23%, then Arizona at 17%, and Utah at 11%. Please recall from the previous slide that about 80% of the water that these states are drawing off of the Colorado River is going to irrigation or for providing water to livestock. The pictures presented on this slide are pictures of aqueducts that transport and move water across these seven different states from the Colorado River in order to basically pool the water to different regions that have need for it. There were also some pictures of aqueducts on the previous slide as well. Thus far we've focused on surface water resources. Now let's shift to groundwater resources. In the United States, groundwater is being withdrawn on average about four times faster than it can be replenished. There are aquifers found throughout the United States, but they vary widely in terms of ability to store and recharge water. The colors on this map illustrate aquifer location and geology. The blue colors indicate unconsolidated sand and gravel aquifers. The yellow colors indicate semi-consolidated sand. The green is considered to be sandstone aquifers. The blue and purple is sandstone and carbonate rock aquifers, and the brown are carbonate rock aquifers, with the red being igneous and metamorphic rock aquifers. So this is a figure from the United States Geological Survey. So this map depicts the various aquifers located around the United States. And then this map depicts the percent of total withdrawals from those aquifers. It's a ratio of groundwater withdrawals to the total withdrawals from all surface and groundwater sources by county. So basically they added total withdrawals from surface water and groundwater and then figured out the percentage of withdrawal that was coming strictly from groundwater. The map illustrates that aquifers are the main an often exclusive water supply source for many of our U.S. regions, especially in the Great Plains area, the Mississippi River area, East Central United States, the Great Lakes region, Florida, and other coastal areas. Groundwater aquifers in these regions are prone to impact due to the combined climate and water use change that's going on. So anything that's colored dark blue or this aqua blue and even this blue, any of these blues means that about 70 to 100 percent of the water withdrawal for that region is coming from the aquifers and then only 30 percent or zero percent is coming from surface water. So when you pull more groundwater out of the subsurface than what can be recharged, the result is that you get a lowered groundwater table. A ripple effect of this is that as the groundwater table goes deeper, you can have land subsidence occur on a regional scale because the openings in the subsurface that were once filled with groundwater collapse. You can also get sinkholes and saltwater intrusion and smaller surface water bodies because the groundwater is not feeding into them. The photograph on the right illustrates subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley, California. There's a USGS scientist in the picture that's depicting from 1925 to 1977 that land subsidence ranged from 1 foot to 28 feet. Also, land subsidence is occurring at about a rate of 1 foot per year in some of the regions in California. 
Phoenix, Arizona is also experiencing land subsidence issues as well.